morning, good afternoon, <laughs> good evening, round two today. Uh, welcome to our episode of the Stories Women Carry. We're at episode nine, uh, third one of this season and sort of ninth one of the larger series. Um, my name is Karishma Bagani. I'm your official question asker and host of the series. And we essentially cover a creative practice of uh, women on the African continent in the diaspora. And uh, it's, it's my privilege to introduce Princess, um, who is in South Africa at the moment. So today we're going down south. Um, hi, Princess. Hi, Karishma. Hi, everyone who's tuning in. So good to have you here, Princess. Uh, thank you so much for making the time uh, in the evening to speak with us today. Thank you so much for invitation. I mean, super excited. <laughs> <laughs> really excited to have you. Um, before I sort of jump in, I just want to again thank our uh, producers, the HowlRound Theatre Commons, for hosting this series and for hosting us on their website. And also thank the Tebury Arts Foundation and the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative who are uh, co-presenters co and partners on this series with us. Um, we have our wonderful American Sign Language interpreter, Zina, who is here with us, has been here with us. So thank you for uh, speaking a different language and for making this more accessible for um, our, our diverse audiences. Mm -hmm. So um, I have, so I, folks, I had the privilege of meeting Princess what, uh, a year ago, I believe, a year and a half ago. We haven't yeah. ever met in person, but it feels like we're family already because we mm. work together and are fellows at the Georgetown Lab for Global Performance and Politics, um, which is a lab that selects 10 fellows every year um, to discuss and, and art at the intersection of politics. So um, it was my privilege to, to, to meet Princess and learn about her work there. And so I'm very excited for her to be sharing it with you today. Uh, Princess, for those of us, for those of our audiences don't know the awesomeness that is in this package of your human body, tell us, who are you? Sure, um, I think uh, always a difficult question to answer when you do so much. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I pride myself in, in you know, just expanding um, the different fields of work that I engage with. First and foremost, I am a theatre director, um, producer, um, and I've been in the industry for over 10 years now um, and have really had a, a great uh, um, career so far. Um, my work has traveled, my work has um, um, really changed, or, or sort of, I could say, launched a lot of uh, uh, young artist careers. Um, because I always say I was sort of the guinea pig as a young Black female theater director. There were very few of my kind when I started. So I believe um, I, I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity to direct a lot of work, some my own that I've devised, other work that uh, collaborate with playwrights. Um, and I think for the past maybe six years of my career, I went into uh, managing an independent space uh, and that sort of defined a lot of the last part or you know, the past few years of my career as an independent creator. So yeah, I could say I, um, I've sort of tried to dive in as much as I can to learn as much as possible to survive in this uh, rat race. <laughs> yeah, rat race it is for sure. Um, <laughs> you spoke a lot about, well, you started off by saying, you know, as, as one of the few uh, female black artists in, in, you know, doing the work that you're doing. Um, I'm sure yeah. that that must come with stigma and struggle and, you know, I, I can't imagine how that must manifest it. And I say that just because as a South Asian Kenyan, it's, a, it's also a very interesting sort of dynamic being a female director in my, in, in my space and sphere. So um, can you talk a little bit about sort of how you got into the arts and, and why you chose this trajectory? And, and uh, you said it was unconventional for you. So what was that like? What, uh, you know, what yeah. were the differences in this journey for you? Yeah, I think uh, from high school already, there was a huge interest 
Um, and I was fortunate enough that I had a mentor, Ishmael Muhammad, um, who was based in my hometown at that time and had started um, an um, uh, acting group. And so we would create work, he would direct, and then we'd also take the work to Grahamstown. And while we're in Grahamstown, we we'll get the opportunity to be in the main festival and also school festival as performers. So, I mean, having that type of opportunity just, you know, um, allowed me to, you know, get a clear perspective of what the industry for myself could be. Uh, so already from, from high school, I already knew that I wanted to, you know, explore that part. So I went to study. However, directing was not, you know, in the cards. I really wa wanted to act. I really wanted to act. Um, but when I got the opportunity in my final year, fourth year to direct, that's when I sort of thought, hang on, there's something here. And from there, I think, like I'm saying, because there weren't a lot of female directors, you know, as soon as uh, um, the theater started to see, you know, my work at school, there was a huge interest in what I was doing and how uh, and the type of stories that I was interested in telling. So uh, from there, State Theater approached me and gave me an opportunity to direct. Uh, so that was really my breakthrough and one of the show that I did was And the Girls in Their Sunday Dresses by Zay Simda. And uh, that sort of, you know, uh, um, really opened up the doors for me. Mm, and what's it like now for the for for a young um, artist, a female artist of color that would be interested in the arts or a young person who's, who's interested in creating like, uh, you know, work in the sector? What is it like now for you? How um, has the, the, would you say that the creative sector has changed over time to be more accommodating? Um, or do you still feel as though there are spaces where there's room for improvement to, you know, expand um, mm. opportunities in the sector? Um, Karishma, I think there's always room to improve, you know. Um, I think there's definitely not enough, you know, that is done currently for female voices. Uh, I think female voices are doing a lot of the work on their own, you know. Um, mm. Uh, mm. Um, and I think the industry is not easy at all, you know. Uh, I, I don't want to. And I think that was something that I fought a lot, that I didn't want to be placed in some, you know, high pedestal of like, I'm a female director, give me opportunities. I really wanted to prove myself, you know, as soon as I uh, discovered the talent, I wanted to keep on learning and improving. So a lot of the times I really fought against uh, uh, structures that limited my growth. I wanted to find out about producing. I wanted to find out about uh, how I would create and write my own work. And I think uh, a lot of the female directors or, or theater makers currently are doing exactly that. They are fighting for their voices to be heard uh, and really grabbing any opportunity that comes to do that, you know. So I, I don't think uh, it's definitely easier in any way. Um, the fight is still the same, you know, uh, even when I think of just, uh, you know, theater makers who are really making a mark, it's still a large part, you know, focused on, on, on males. So uh, a lot of work still needs to be done in that sector. Right. Well, it's really inspired. I mean, it's, it's very profound and it strikes me what you said about how you sort of continue to expand your talent and continue to focus on that as opposed to continuously be su being subjected to this idea of, okay, so I'm a female and so I'm a female director. And so that means something, right? And, and so uh, this is why I should get this opportunity. I think mm, it's really, really important to emphasize being good at your craft as the first thing, you know, that um, should speak to any artist that's interested in, um, in working with you, creating creating the art with you. Um, and, and so to pivot on that, I would love to learn a little bit more about your practice. Um, you spoke earlier about directing other people's work and then also directing some of your own work and devising. Um, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about maybe two productions that you've worked on that are different and um, what the processes looked like for those two and, and how they differed? Yeah. Um... I think I'll, I'll speak on my most recent work because um, I think it's sort of 
uh, um, represent my shift as a, as a theater maker and how one has to adapt, you know, because um, honestly, I feel my career from a young age, like I was saying, I, I was really thrown with a lot of opportunities, you know, at times I felt undeserved, you know. Um, however, uh, um, once I came, especially when I hit 10 years in the industry, I really wanted to uh, um, define my practice as well, you know, going to a direction where I wanted to uh, um, explore, you know, the type of stories I wanted to tell. And one is, is a production called Faceless, uh, which is very experimental. Um, I, I do, did it during COVID times and of course theaters were closed. So it forced me to sort of figure out a different way of bringing my actors together, collaborating and seeing, you know, um, how uh, we tell stories. So this particular production I created separately. So I have two performers in it um, and the two actors have never met. However, the story uh, 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 links them together, right? And um, this was interesting for me because it, it was a way of devising without any uh, theater or producer pressure. You know, it was really purely um, creative selfishness, if you would say. So I really enjoyed that process uh, as it forced me, like I'm saying, to adapt and see, okay, what is the way that I can um, engage with my audience especially during these uh, difficult times, you know. Um, so I enjoyed that uh, um, that piece very much. So it's, and, and now it's archived, it lives, people can engage with it, which is something different uh, to my past work. Um, one work that I did was a musical called Divas of Gofifi. And that was sort of, um, that was in 2016 and it was a huge production. Um, Huge production. I we had um, uh, Mam Dorothy Masuga. We had uh, Mam Tandi Klassen before they both passed on. So this, for me, when I engaged or uh, I went into that production, I felt was a production that would sort of live on, you know. Um, uh, and it took a very long time to create, you know. So I really invested a lot in that process uh, of of creating work with a playwright. Uh, having producers well-funded. So it really allowed me to really explore and expand as, as far as I could in, in a musical theater. Um, so I think they're very different because one is, you know, is selfish, is small, you know, whereas the other one had everything that I needed. However, uh, it was still hard to, to, to maintain the lifespan of the show, which for me, was part of the disappointment in the industry of how do we keep our work alive, you know, uh, so it can live on and carry the stories of, of legends like Dorothy Masuga and, uh, and Mam Tandi Klassen. So I think both of those shows sort of, um, you know, were at a time in my life where I was requiring some kind of change uh, in my own personal career. Oh, it's so fascinating to hear you talk about the differences in those and I'm sure and you know inevitably the external circumstances uh, really affected the way uh, you you devised. Uh, I have a few questions about the the one that you did most recently faceless but before we move to that um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about what you wish during the time that you the, the, when you were um, staging the other production what would you wish you had to inc increase the lifespan of the show? Um... I think that particular show, I mean, like I'm saying, I've always been interested in producing, right? Because uh, I feel it's, it, it's, it's, it's fundamental to have good producers to ensure that our work have a, a, a long lifespan, you know? So with this particular work, I wish I had well-informed, experienced producers, you know, which I think it's part of the issue that we're experiencing in South Africa in terms of corruption and, you know, uh, uh, people just receiving funds who, who don't really necessarily know the work that it entails. So with that production, I wish that we had, creatively, we had a great team. 
However, you know, uh, um, just in, 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 in production, in terms of the team who could, you know, take the show uh, uh, further than where it went, uh, I think that was the disappointing part for me. Because I, if I'm a director, I want to be a creative. I don't also want to produce, you know, um, especially with such a production. So I wish that we had <laughs> great producers who could just, you know, have, you know, I mean, if you think of South African shows that have lived for long, Sarafina, Waza Albeck, you know, uh, there's a reason why those shows worked and we can use the same methods to ensure that new voices, the shows that we do now can also live on and, you know, become an archive for, for the future. Because if those stories don't uh, uh, live on, then, you know, how do we, we, we carry that history? Totally, totally. And I think there's a very interesting <laughs> stereotype, myth, I don't know what we would call it, um, on the rest of the continent, at least about South Africa, because of shows like Waza Albert and because of shows like Sarafina um, existing, there's this idea and myth that South Africa has it all and South Africa is the next Broadway. And South Africa has these infrastructures that's going to keep it going. But in mm. you know my conversations with you and in uh, uh, conversations with a lot of other colleagues, it feels as though um, there's a lot of infrastructure in the country as well that is yet to be developed, that is still sort of um, in the creation stages to, to be able to sustain this kind of work in the longer term. Yeah. I think yeah. Generally, as an African continent, we are moving towards this idea of being able to archive and tell our own stories and present them on mm. a global platform. Um, and yet still continue to struggle with this, this question of sustainability and, and maintaining things. Yeah. Um, and it's if, if uh, just just to share, you know, uh, part of our series uh, on the uh, stories women, women carry will actually highlight some of these pr platforms um, in the next few weeks. We're going to be speaking with, actually next week we're going to be speaking with Nikkei Jonah, who is uh, mm -hmm. the executive director of the Pan African Creative Exchange Pace, um, which is which they're not really producers as much as they are a presenting platform um, yeah. that it works out of the Vristat Arts Festival in South Africa. And um, they do have a producer's lab and they work through mm. having a lot of workshops um, to, to, again, create the sustainable infrastructure that we're talking about, not mm. only in terms of, of theater spaces, but also in terms of the people, right? Um, yeah. I think, I think right. <laughs> we, we have, we have the, the, the blessing and the curse on the yeah. continent being jacks of all trades and knowing how to produce and direct at mm. the same time. Yeah. Um, then not in and that you know sort of being a shortfall when it comes to the kind of work that we produce yes true how do you balance all of these interests of yours how do you make sure that the creative juices in directing and in producing and in the music mm. and your involvement in the music industry which i believe you mm. haven't yet mentioned which i know about yeah <laughs> how do you balance all of these things just knowing you as a person also you have this thirst for for knowledge and everything that you do so well, mm. yeah what secret i think i definitely give each thing its own time um, um by the time i got into producing you know i had sort of really explored as much as i can in directing you know um to the point where i wanted to produce my own work and felt the stress of that then you know started to focus on other people's work you know um, same with going into music, you know, I, I literally had to take a break and not direct and focus on that, you know. Um, so I really have to give each thing time uh, as much as, you know, you'd want to just mix it all. It, it's, it's definitely not easy at all. Um, um, when I went into music management, um, managing an artist, I... I even had to just focus on that one, one artist because I knew, you know, this is a new industry and um, I need to learn as much as I can, you know, so I need to give it time. So, yeah, I think um, that's what I do. I just give each thing time and really put my all into it. Yeah, I mean, even, even in my conversations with you or just learning from you during our fellowship calls uh, through the lab, like it's been really interesting to hear your journey and, and also hear you speak about the things that you've learned and that you're able to transfer from the things that you've been doing. 
So mm. while you keep things separate, if I were to ask you, what are the three things that you'd say, or skills that you would say are transferable with all of the things that you do? What would those mm. be? Uh, so management throughout, I think just project management in general, I look at each, <laughs> whether it's an artist, a film, you know, everything needs to be managed well, you know, that's number one. Secondly, a good team. Um, I've learned that I cannot do anything alone. So in everything I do, I ensure at least I have two or three people, you know, who know the vision and know where we're going and ride or die, you know? And I mean, I have to have fun. <laughs> If the fun stops, you know, then, <laughs> then I know. And I think What's music, fun? yo, music was one way it was fun in the beginning. And then it just got stressful, you know, and I think it's, it has to do with money as well. You know, uh, uh, music, uh, I think money, you know, you can access it much quicker than theater, you know. Um, so I think with music, as soon as oh, it becomes like, oh, once I start to sigh, then I know, okay, time to move on, you know, so, so fun is important for me because it just keeps the drive and the passion going, you know, and I'm always reminded whether we make money or not, you know, I'm having fun and something I love to do. Yeah, I love that spirit. I think the spirit of the work is in the fun and in the community that you build and the teamwork as well. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. I, I uh, continue to strive to apply that in my own work as well. Just have fun. And when you're not having fun, change something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, take us back to when you were talking about the different productions. You were speaking about yeah. Faceless as well. And I, I uh, sort of the gist of the conversation that we're having today is directing during the time of COVID, you know? Mm. Um, so, and before I do that, I just also want to say that to our audience members, if you're tuned in on Facebook or Twitter or the HowlRound platform, um, these are all open for you to ask questions uh, to Princess. So I can continue asking the questions, of course, and have loads. Um, but uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask as this conversation moves forward, please feel, feel free to put them in the chat and um, they'll be relayed to us and we'll try our best to get to them. So yeah, please do, please do do that. Um, so I, I'll move on with my question. Um, what was that experience like for you? How did that shift, you know, from that? I mean, it was a big shift for everybody, but uh, what yeah. was that experience like for you specifically? Yeah, uh, I think, um, sure. I always say, you know, in, in South Africa, um, theater makers are generally creating and we're not creating with the know that my work will land in a mainstream theater. You know, I think um, mainstream theater still really has a handful of uh, theater makers that, you know, get the opportunity to get their work fully produced, you know? Uh, so it's always been that not everybody gets their work to be in the mainstream, even myself, you know, I've had that opportunity and it's a struggle to get back and say, hey, you know, uh, um, I'm still a voice, Just, you know, they, it's still very hard. Uh, so I think- Sorry, uh, can I interrupt you? Sorry, I just want to interrupt you and ask when, just for our audiences for context, when you say mainstream, what do you mean? So when I'm saying mainstream, I'm referring to, uh, uh, this is our theaters, basically. So this is where-, um, where So not um, Broadway, right? You're not thinking, you're not talking no. Broadway. You're Okay. No, no, this is just our theaters, which is not quite a lot, it's, but we, we have, you know, I think in um, Johannesburg alone, maybe there's a good three or four that, you know, well operating theaters that I could try my luck um, in submitting work. So, and what I mean is we, you know, theaters currently are not so much, or for the past few years, you know, there wouldn't be an open call, submit work, you know, we don't have those type of structures anymore. Whereas in my time when I was entering, actually that was how you would, you know, uh, uh, propose your work and 
pitch your ideas, you know, as a theatre director. So I think a lot of theatre directors for the past few years have really been struggling on, uh, I have this voice, but where do I take it? You know, how do I engage with theatres and say, please produce my work, you know, if I'm not producing myself. So I think theatre makers have just generally be, been creating anyway, without the know of where it would land, you know. So when COVID hit for me, I think like I'm saying, I was already going through the transition. I had just finished my music journey and I was, you know, going back into, you know, telling my own stories as a, a theater maker. So it was the perfect time for me, you know, where everyone in a way is starting over and trying to redefine the type of stories they want to tell and where, you know. Um, so what was fortunate for me is that my husband is a, a film director, you know, so for the first time in a long time now we're talking about my work, you know, uh, um, in, <laughs> in, in a film structure type of thing. So, so it, it, it was great to have that support, you know, and really ask, you know, what is theater when it's recorded? Um, where will this thing live? whatever I'm doing, where will I live, where, how do I share it, you know, with people, and I think for me, I had to focus on the advantages of where we were, rather than the disadvantages, I didn't want to stress about not having access to a theater, because that's not easy anyway, where, at the current moment, I didn't want to stress about how I'll engage with my actors, you know, we just had to find means, and like I'm saying, with Faceless, I basically had to uh, uh, limit my cost and really have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, interaction with each actor. And that's how we created the work. And it fitted well within the, the, the theme that I was exploring, you know? So um, uh, for me, it, it was definitely hard, but there were just still ways of not shutting out and still creating work and which I think is important for everyone we always need to continue to create and find ways of telling our stories uh, so for me it didn't stop I, I told the stories anyway just in a different medium yeah and to that end do you think you know South Africa or in the world do you think that theater in the way that we knew it before this pandemic still stands a chance of existing in the same way um ash. It, it, it's it, it's currently not right, ash is right let's just like take a moment and do that together again <laughs> what a question it, it's, <laughs> it's so painful you know it's just the truth is it, it probably won't you know it probably won't we've we've you know i feel like um just once we've uh, explored and experienced a different way, you know, that will forever be part of it. I think festivals, for example, will always think of a digital festival, an online, you know, experience, or even just mixing, right? So I feel what we've gone through, we can't just drop it and, you know, start, go back to what it was. I think it's forever affected uh, just how we think. For me, as a theater maker, uh, I've always known that I can't just be a theater maker. I need to also put on a hat on uh, in understanding how does my work get to the audience, you know? And I feel just engaging with this uh, uh, digital way of creating just allows my work, that's the positive for me. Suddenly people can watch my work from wherever, you know? Uh, um, however, I still feel that I try not to sell it as the work for me. You know, I, I still, I, for me, it's like a marketing tool. So I'm still saying, hey, this is what I'm interested in. This is my practice, you know. I would still try, I love to, you know, um, engage in how we can still have the face-to-face -face experience, you know, um, which for me will forever be theater, whether it's limited to the number of people who experience that or not. I think that's still, you know, the core of, of of what theater is, you know, you need to have that audience in front of you, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, it's definitely changed. Um, it will definitely, for me, stay in a way that it's affected, but will forever be trying to evolve 
uh, and just find different means and ways of making sure that our stories are heard you know so yeah it's 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 hard it's <laughs> it's hard yeah, and I think that will come with, uh, we'll ask, or sorry, I lost you in between for a little bit because of my internet, but I think th that hybrid form from a producing perspective and a directing perspective is going to ask for a different skill set. So even within the yeah. world of education, for example, there'll be a level of sort of cross-pollination of some of the things that will be needed to think about a Zoom play, you know. Uh, yeah. One of our previous panelists in the previous season, Asimwe, Asimwe Deborah and I were having a conversation a while ago and she's a playwright and she was telling me how most of the plays that she's written in the last few months have been for Zoom or for online consumption. Yeah. And so she's yeah. almost convinced that there's going to be a genre and there's going to be a, yeah. a new, like a course that could be taught for just the Zoom play and what that yeah. structure looks like and what, you know. Yeah. Um, I think there's some interesting questions there about accessibility you know? exactly um, yeah would you say that it, the online zoom production of faithless by virtue of it, oh i lost you there Karishma. Hello? can you hear oh, me i'm sorry it seems like the internet is is active. yes can you hear me now yeah sorry so where did you lose me sorry folks no, you were talking about the accessibility. So uh, would you say that? Yes. OK. So would you say that your your the Zoom version of Faceless, um, mm. by virtue of it being on Zoom, was more accessible or reached a wider audience or an audience that wouldn't have come for it otherwise if it was in person? Um, mm, not necessarily. Um, I still feel like I'm saying I, I that particular project um, was a form also uh, looking at archiving and not necessarily a live experience. So I, I didn't showcase it to a Zoom audience at all. I, I So part of the exploring for me was how it's recorded and how we experiment with the actors in, in, in putting it together. And where for me it's the advantage is that it's something that I can definitely pass on and share at whatever time or year, you know, it can definitely live on, you know. Um, but there definitely uh, um, is a problem with accessibility if we just focus, you know, if, if, if our industry now just focuses on online and Zoom theater, Zoom shows, you know. Um, I know for, for, for a fact that uh, not everyone was able to adapt, you know, not everyone was able to engage with this world that we now know, you know, there's still a lot of uh, theater makers, you know, um, just even in my hometown, I did a workshop there just to, you know, bring them into what, how the world has been evolving, evolving in terms of theater, that let's write some new plays, let's try and record them, not as a way of saying, hey, watch this, but saying, hey, actually, this is a show we've done and we've recorded. Here's a snippet. Please, you know, uh, uh, let's see what we can do with this production, you know. So, so it's just uh, giving people that accessibility to knowing that these type of things are possible and uh, this is happening uh, in a lot of countries. So, but I think it would definitely uh, uh, not uh, and it's still not, you know, not a lot of people were able to transition into that uh, new way of making theatre. So uh, accessibility definitely would be a problem for a lot of young voices. Yeah, and it's it's actually precisely the reason why I feel like um, uh, more convenings um, and more spaces for young people to connect with and converse with each other whether in person or online are all the more important because yeah. I feel as though at least as a young artist like the our generation um well our generation is our first audience in many ways you know and yeah. so I think you've, you've spoken to a really important point of accessibility when it comes to our, our generations also mm. um and in that regard I mean I guess this is more more of a so the personal question, but we can share it with the world, given that both of us are lab fellows. Um, 
as we sort of wrap up our formal time at the lab, you know, we were supposed to have had our, we would have been in person actually for our festival at this moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been giving you a hug in person. That's I know. I know. Again, like I think there's a blessing in there because we have our program slightly extended, meaning that we get to interact with each other like this um, for a longer period of time. But also yeah. sad that we haven't been able to meet in person yet. Uh, but yeah. I'm curious to hear how that interaction and with with uh, fellows from around the world uh, how that interaction mm. has if at all shaped you or shaped your practice or you know yeah. just some reflections about the lab um yeah 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 yo i mean the lab was a huge blessing karishma yo uh, uh it really like 2010 for me, uh, 2019, so I finished off with uh, uh, something, so it which was the musician that I was managing. Um, and I sort of, you know, wanted to really get back into, you know, being in a space of wanting to create, you know. Uh, so when I got accepted to be part of the lab, um, that was great. But then actually meeting and, you know, sitting in a Zoom room of, different creatives from all over the world um, and here we are going through this pandemic together you know uh, uh, it was really like I, I would say to to Emma and everyone else that you know it, it was really a counseling session for me it was a pick me up you know it was like whoa okay she's doing that he's doing that come on princess what are you doing you know um, so it was a huge blessing a huge uh, a shoulder that really you could stand on and be strong from all parts, you know, where all of us were just going through different things in different ways, you know, and really sharing uh, uh, the different emotional journeys everyone was going through, you know. Um, so for me, it was a huge blessing that I could be part of that and still find a way of being a creative because it's very easy to just sink in and drown. So I couldn't. I felt like I had people who were, who had my back. People who didn't know me, but supported me creatively, you know, uh, and really believed in um, what I could achieve before I even knew. So it was great that we could just, you know, uh, project to, oh, next year, this time next year, I would have done this. So, it, and, and then to reflect again this year and say, wow, you know, last year we were actually dreaming about the things we were going to do. And here we are sitting and we've, you know, all accomplished a lot and much more. Uh, it's really been a, a great, great experience to be part of the lab. Yeah, I, feelings are mutual, really. I, you, I think you really also express my feelings, sentiments about it, um, especially when you spoke about this idea of us being pushing each other along, even though we've never met. It feels like we're mm. family in a community and trying mm. to understand each other's practice. And then also knowing when things aren't happening in your life, also knowing that it's also the same for everybody else. So it's okay yes. to take a break <laughs> and it's okay to be like, yeah, nothing's happening and that's okay. Yeah. And we're, you just got to take a break, man, because yeah. I think the there's an immense amount of pressure mm. that has been placed on creative during this time, mm. right? Because yeah. everybody's home, everybody wants new content, yet there's mm. no funding for artists or very minimal funding, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's this pressure for us to, okay, create content now, get with the times, get with the times. Yeah. But what about us? What about our family? Yeah. What about our mental state of being? You know? Mental state, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. You know, I'd love to wrap up our. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Seems like my internet is also um, playing some games with me. Mm. <laughs> can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Great. Um, okay, cool. I was going to say, I, uh, so for folks who are, great. So for folks that are frequent uh, um, uh, viewers or for folks that have not been on the Howran website before, the lab has actually done, uh, or our fellows group, <coughs> uh, excuse me, um, have a uh, 
an article published and then a couple of web series published as well on how around yeah. platforms. So if you'd like to check those out, we did a couple of collaborative projects that we shared with everybody there. So uh, that might be a cool thing for you to check out after our conversation today. Yeah. Um, so I guess I want to wrap up here uh, with you with, with just one last question about any advice that you may have for a young and budding artist or just for an artist in this time that is seeking direction. Oh, no pun in intended there, but I guess it just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, for me, um, it's just always been important to create, right? Um, in whichever way, whether it's the beginning part of just an idea, we have to continue to create and tell our stories. Um, and one thing that I've always been passionate about, and I feel in South Africa, we, we, we sort of, um, uh, we need a lot of development in that sense, you know, uh, which is why I created a platform, a space called a platform, you know, for young voices, was I was very concerned on what are we as the youth, you know, saying about what's happening now? You know, what are the stories that we, we are telling that will inform the future about what we were experiencing, you know, uh, uh, what was happening culturally or politically in the country, you know, right now in 2020, 2021, you know, um, and a space for me has has always been a crucial part in you know in in in, in developing those voices uh, but then running a space was expensive um and i felt hey maybe we need to just relook at what a space is you know uh and where <laughs> where you know where can we tell these stories and i think 2020 covid sort of allowed creatives to start thinking in that way, you know, that stories can be told anywhere, anyhow, uh, uh, be brave, you know, don't limit yourself. Uh, we need game changers right now. We need artists. Uh, I mean, a few years last year, we didn't have Zoom theater. Now, like you're saying, you know, we're gonna have to create a, a whole new sector that will uh, focus on that, you know, so, uh, I, I think for, for young voices right now, we need to hear your voices as the times evolve and change. We need to hear what, what is happening. Uh, you are the, you know, the industry is in your hands, you know, um, um, uh, and we are the only ones who can really be the change makers, you know. Uh, South Africans right now are fighting a fight on corruption. You know, we need to hear those stories. We need to be the ones who write and report what was happening in this time as uh, artists are protesting against, uh, uh, you know, um, the National Arts Council and corruption uh, um, stories right now. So yeah, like, uh, don't be afraid to be that voice, you know, don't be afraid to be heard. What a profound note to end on. What a profound note to end on. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I think there's no better way than to know that your story doesn't need a platform that's a stage, right? It just needs mm. you and and your voice. So that's yeah. Cool. Um, thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and to you and all the amazing work that that oh, you no, do. Can I, you again? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> oh, I lost you there, but thank you. Uh, I, I, I was I thanking saw that you. you were giving me some flowers. So I was receiving them. Thank props. you. <laughs> I was giving you props. <laughs> this, this, uh, conversation and insights and just I'm always in awe of, of your work and your on our on our, our continent. So really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Karishma, and to Howround and everyone else watching in. Thank you for the time. Um, really appreciate being given the, the platform really to, to share my work. And I uh, just also want to uh, give a quick thank to Jaren, uh, who's also 
open for uh, sign language interpretation. So we appreciate Jerry um, Breaking a bit. We've lost our dear lady. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you.